My name is uh, Stefan Schneider, and I guess if I um, have to tag myself, I would say, you know, uh, Swiss and wood and machines, that's kind of <laughs> the quick way, but but I am. So I, uh, I come from Switzerland, I grew up there, did my schooling there, and then came over here kind of with the whole digital manufacturing. So I have a building background and uh, started working for a European software company, kind of traveling around all over the world, but mostly in the US and in Canada, kind of installing automated systems, mostly for the wood industry. So um, timber framers, glue line manufacturer, prefabricated home builders, and so we work with uh, different kind of machines. So I kind of want to give you a quick overview a little bit what, what's available today, what, what kind of um, machines um, uh, are in use for what kind of application. And, uh, and then I kind of show you a few projects as well. This is one um, that we're using. I'm not sure if it's that. Yeah. So we know anything. But this is basically a five axis gantry type beam processor. Um, it, it does milling, it does sawing, it does drilling. Um, it runs on a gantry. That means we just put the block of wood down there and then it kind of does whatever we tell it to do. Um, so that's, that's one of the machines we're working with. If I give you a little bit more specifics, that was just a, a tool change. All right, so that gives you a little bit the idea. Um, I'll go through a few slides here. Um, digital fabrication projects, why is that so exciting? Um, I mean, there's two things we can achieve with digital uh, um, manufacturing. One is like higher output. Uh, we can basically produce a lot of stuff really fast, it's just the general automation. But right now, the direction we would like to head is more like we want to be able to stuff that nobody else can do. It's like how can we use technology to, to uh, you know, do complex shapes like just that facade we just saw or some of those buildings. Those are all wood buildings. So those are uh, each individual member as a different shape. And that's just something you almost could do by hand, just figuring out all those angles. Um, a few other projects, this one is coming, this is also in Europe, the new Swatch uh, Pavilion, uh, but also simple thing, that's a project we did, is that all those panels were prefabricated as assemblies, um, uh, cut using CNC machines. High performance buildings, I'm not sure if you're familiar with like Net Zero and Passive House, so we're trying to push really hard uh, for Passive House. That does look like a traditional house, but it's one of the first Passive Houses built um, in, uh, in BC, in the greater Vancouver area. So the deal with that house is it's basically not supposed to use any or hardly any um, thermal energy. So really big walls, great windows. And using digital manufacturing, we achieve tighter tolerances, essentially trying to create a more airtight building envelope and reducing the thermal um, glass through for gaps and so on. Um, What's the motivation? Like I said, I grew up in a shop where we did everything by hand. The whole idea is how can we take the best craftsmen there is, and there isn't that many left, and how can we you know, replace the chisel and give him a digital tool? So we merge craftsmanship and technology, and we achieve better things. Um, there is still a lot of handwork involved. As I always hear, it's like, oh, your computers and robotics are going to take all our chops away. That's not how it is. It's just like we take it to the next level and we make things happen that other people otherwise just couldn't do it or couldn't afford it. So those are typical timber frame parts. The whole thing here doesn't have a single screw or bolt in it. Everything is more as intended and kind of notched and we did that all with a machine. So this is a, an example from a really traditional, crafty um, type of product using like very high tech. This was a five axis. Um, um, beam processor machine that did. Um, other um, digital fabrication products, uh, you know, the steel industry, they're a little further, I think, than the wood industry. There's quite a bit of machines out there. Um, you're probably familiar with uh, laser cutting, HD um, plasma cutter uh, technology, water chip, all that stuff. What are the goals? Uh, why do we do that? So basically, that's just kind of more, I think everybody wants to do that, but that's kind of the personal motivation, but we, we can make better products and we can make that more affordable by using technology. Um, I always uh, like to say that being from Switzerland, I grew up right next to Swatch with having my mom working in the watch industry. And Hayek, the guy that came up with Swatch, he said, I want to have 
a watch that is affordable for everybody, as many watches as you want. They, they have to be cool, and they have to be as good or better than the Rolex. And it, I don't want it to cost more than $50 or Swiss francs. And, and everybody's like, you're crazy, that's not possible. There is like 10 million parts in a, in a Rolex. And, and so he said, we can use technology and we can make that happen. And they did, they reduced the, the number of parts, they made component groups, and they used uh, robotics and, and uh, computers to, to do that. And, and uh, the result was that plastic watch, which was a completely different concept, but was super cool, super successful, and, um, and it worked out. So this is what we want to do with, with buildings. We need to figure out how we can make super energy efficient buildings affordable for the big mass, and I think the technology is kind of uh, the goal. Um, also, the waste in buildings, it's, um, it's amazing how much building materials we waste. What do we have today? I just made that really fast, but basically for, um, for the wood industry, like I say, we have gantry type machines, we have like beam processors, I'm gonna go through all of that um, in a minute here, uh, but basically big machines because the parts are big. And then on the metal end, we have like either it's milling or it's laser cutting or it's HD plasma or water chains. Um, how do those machines look like that? You'll see if you look for that um, name list, most everything is European. That kind of got me over here too. So for some reason, I don't know why that is, um, all of the machines in the wood industry are from Europe. There's, uh, they're from France, they're from Germany, this one's from Germany, uh, they're from Italy, but there's, there's nothing in the States available. Uh, on the steel industry, there's actually quite a bit of US machines, um, as well as like machines from Japan. So this is kind of what we use, this is a Hundegger K2, this is a K2 robot as it's called, it's essentially a six axis spindle with a tool changer um, cutting, this is a dovetail, so we would do more as tenon dovetail slot, pretty much everything you would have to cut on a piece of wood. Um, here are a few examples, uh, compound cuts, so those are, that's a combination of saw cuts, uh, milling notches, um, here we have slots, this is essentially a CNC controlled chainsaw that cuts a, a, a slot for, for knife blades, uh, compound cuts and, and drillings for that part, things like that, um, contour milling for braces. So that's stuff we would run through a, through a beam processor like that K2. Um, there is a lot of like, this is a speed cut, this is a very fast machine. Similar deal, those are basically automated cutting saws. So they're very basic, some of them, they have now mill units, but it's just that's what the truss plant would use, that's what you'd use for wall panels, things like that. So uh, here's a couple products, that's what that machine would do. So you feed it in, it would cut the stair stringer, or it would basically pre-cut sticks for walls, floors, things like that. Um, Automated assembly, that's kind of the next level that we're trying to push really hard. That's something that's done very rarely in the building industry, and, and uh, there's a, a few reasons why. One of it is it's like it's always a one-off run. It's, we never have like 20,000 times the same product. But here's a, a German assembly line for wall panels. So that line basically has nail guns on it. The first um, station would, um, would basically frame the wall. The next station would put those sheets on with, um, with suction cups, positions it automatically, nails the whole thing up, does the window opening. All that data comes straight from 3D, so we basically have a level of detail in those, in those 3D files, which I'm gonna show later, where, to the degree where every nail is defined in 3D. It's not that you're gonna add like 500 million nails, but you add rules for this type, shear wall, you have a two-inch nailing pattern and things like that. And then the machine knows how to position and, and does that. Um, this is a, a CAM preview. This is basically the software that runs on that machine. And it's probably hard to see for you, but those little dots are all nails. And, and here are basically the nail patterns and so on. Um, this is great because it also makes it very predictable. We know this is going to take 12 and a half minutes to frame that wall and things like that. Um, I like to show that slice. That's something I'm really proud of. It's, uh, if you've ever been to a construction site, it doesn't look like that. That's basically from cutting, you know, half a house. So what we do is we wouldn't cut all the parts from that wall. We cut this wall and then that wall and the other wall. So we use computers to do a length optimization. That's basically one stick, and that's kind of how it works. So there's two of those, there's one of that, and then in the end, we should have waste 5% or less, you know, uh, supposedly like 30% or more on site, yes. 
I just like to add something, especially when it comes to the nail patterns. Yeah. For anybody who's actually been out on the construction site, uh, when you have the building inspector coming out and looking at a shear wall, uh, they'll actually look to see did any of those nails actually penetrate the top layer of the membrane, the top layer of the plywood, and if it has, if you have too many of those nails on a single sheet, they'll make the pull the sheet off and we nail it so that the nails don't penetrate too far into the wood, reducing the shear. So automating the nailing of this is you know, actually uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, and everybody that's ever done that, those they only make you do that on the shear walls, and that's usually like 500 nails per sheet, or four by eight sheets, that's about what we're talking about. So essentially, almost have to destroy the wall. It's still, besides that, it's still a problem, even with the machine. It's very hard to set up those pressures, and the reason why is uh, you're working with an organic product. So you have a really soft spot in the wood, and the na nail next to it has, um, you know, like a knot or something that is really dense. So how much pressure can you can you add there? So the whole nailing business in an ideal world, maybe 10 years from now, we're just gonna glue those sheets on and be done, like they do it with airplanes and cars now and, and other stuff. I'm, I'm a huge believer of uh, all those new adhesives and things. Uh, nails are great, but it, it is a problem of the machine too. It's, um, it's easier we have consistent pressure um, and we have, you know, the machine puts the sheet down and stuff, but we're still dealing, versus if you do that by hand, you have different angles and stuff, which that, that causes problems. But it's, it's, it's not that easy. Um, anyway, so we run a 3D um, optimizer. We basically um, optimize everything, then we send it to the machine, and we try to reduce um, the offcuts as much as we can. A few more machines, those were those gantry type machines I was talking before. This is essentially what you saw from Josh as well very common in the airplane industry or other industries. It's usually a huge bridge kind of like that and then a mill head or a robot hanging from down and we do all the free form huts. Large format panels, this is a CLT, a cross laminated wood panel, so a solid wood panel, that's kind of a new trend now. Um, so those machines would cut large format panels, but they would also do really complex cuts from not straight beams. So essentially, if the beam is not straight anymore, you can't do um, your, um, your beam processor. It would have to be something like that. Um, you know, like beams like that, how do you make a you know, knife blade cut on a beam that is cut in, in two directions, thing, things like that. That's where those gantry type machines come in. Unfortunately, there is only two gantry type machines in the US and Canada. Actually, that's not true. I think there is none the US right now for the wood industry. There's two in Canada, one on the East Coast and on the West Coast, uh, BC and Quebec, but, but nobody has those. And in Europe, if you go to any glue lamp plant, they're all like value-added glue lamp plants, and, and, and there's very few that cut those type beams by hand. So it's just, um, um, you know, the Europe is just much more ahead of integrating those machines. Um, steel industry, very similar deal. This is a steel machine, a bandsaw, CNC cut. They're gonna show you a little video just real quick. Um, it basically, same deal, we take 3D data um, and you know use those machines to cut, drill, and slot. And the process is, is amazingly similar. It's, um, it's, it's um, the same as for the wood, it's just a different machine. This particular one is an Italian machine for mostly steel I beams and pipes and tubes and things like that, creating objects like that. Um, this is interesting too, those, uh, those plates are not cut with a machine like that. This is basically flat 2D laser cutting uh, or HD plasma. So how does that all work? Um, I'm gonna run you through that real quick and if somebody is interested, I'm happy to show that like live later so we have a smaller group, more time. But essentially we take a BIM model or any 3D model that is modeled with solids, I'm not talking SketchUp, but we take a 3D solid, we try to integrate it in a CAD CAM type software. We use a product called CADWORK from, from Europe, and, and that's kind of a, a 3D tool that merged the machining um, deal with the CAD deal. So we start adding processes already on the CAD level and we do that, that way we can see what, how do those parts connect, how do they, you know, how does the logistic work. So we bring BIM to the next level, we call that BIM fabrication information modeling. So it's just a highly detailed, accurate 3D model that has processing information in it. 
We send it to a post-processor. We, we, um, we run the geometry recognition. We define everything that isn't already defined. And then we create a machine code file. I'm going to show you that. We, we run it then to a, a CAM software and then to the machine. So um, in other words, we have a, a detailed model in, in Revit. Um, we take that into, um, you know, we use ACES or IFC or whatever exchange file, bring it into a CAD work that's CAD work, detail it some more. So I'm talking about adding tolerances and gaps and things like that. And then, um, and then we run it. This is within the CAD program. We can look at each stick and kind of define those processes. And then from there, we run it into uh, through a CNC converter where we kind of say, hey, how are we going to actually make those cuts? And then we would uh, bring it into a CAM program. This is the same software that runs on the machine. Um, and then we uh, simulate, if needed, there's a machine simulator, and then we fabricate those parts <coughs> and ship it to set. So that's kind of the process. I'm going to show you that like in, you know, in the real file real quick. But, but where do we want to go? That's kind of the next thing. And, and like I said, I think the cutting for normal shapes were there. It's really, it's working well. It's like, it's, it's easier now getting from the CAD system to a machine code. But the next level is we want to do more forms, free shapes. Um, I always say that more axes, like five axes is great, but the more axes we have, the more flexible, uh, more flexible we can cut parts. So I think that that's one thing, more complex parts. The other thing is like the building simulation. And then um, for us too, like how can we start making component group like automated assembly, like stuff he pointed out with the nails, um, you know, how can we, because assembly is a lot of work with the logistics of the part. So if we can automate some of that, the data is there. It's just how can we get a machine like that, which is now available fairly affordable, how can we make that thing put stuff together for us? So that's kind of um, what the deal is. I would like to show you, um, you know, a bit more practical, maybe a few of uh, those projects. This is um, something we did with the students um, in a school in, in Canada, it's like a gazebo. Um, fairly simple, but um, a lot of compound parts. Uh, if you ever cut the valley rafter, you kind of know what that means. There's a lot of angles and pockets to figure out. So the way we would do that, and I'm just gonna make that, I know this is kind of quick, but I'll, I'll grab a few random parts uh, maybe get that entry bent, and then maybe those ones are interesting. So if we grab those parts, we um, can go in here and basically run it for a machine converter where there's all those machines I just showed you with pick the K2, and um, tells me there's drillings, that's fine. Um, we can then look at each single piece in here, that's that converter. And so the advantage of that is like we're, we're defining the process in the CAD level, and that can go in there and figure out what's, what's connecting or what not. Those are all my connecting parts. And, and so that's better than doing that on a machine level. Because once I'm on the machine level, I don't really know what's, what's going on. And um, from there, um, we can, you know, there's a, a million settings, which I don't want to bother you. But, but we, we run it for a converter, which again, we say milling, sawing, how are we going to do all of that? And, and we convert and, um, and then run essentially machine. So this is essentially my machine code file now. So I didn't have to program a single thing. I could, I can open those things and it's a code like a script. But, but the, the whole trick here is we get those things fully digital without chop drawing in that CAM converter and then we can mill from there. And here I have still a million options how I would um, do things, how do I want to um, change um, my, um, you know, how do I want to build the whole thing, how do I want to put it on a machine, what kind of uh, shapes are we using, stuff like that. So this is essentially the controls of the CNC machine. So that's kind of, um, of um, the world we're in. And this part, what I just did, that went from, okay, I'm going to write that in a, in, in a text editor and send it to a machine, and I don't know how it's going to look. So it went from that to a um, thing. I'm going to make another one for a smaller machine real quick because that's more exciting. Um, close that. Close that too. Um, 
picked up a few parts just before, like let's just say if I would have something like that, or I can even um, add a few more cuts to make it more exciting, and just add something here, just if you want to have some crocodile bite, yeah, machine data, if you want to do like a free form cut, something like that, um, calculate that. Fine, calculate it. Okay, here, here we have all those things. It just generated that, so I don't have to go manually figure out that that angle is and whatnot. And uh, I'm gonna export that this time to a newer machine, that smaller one you saw. And this is exciting because it's where it's going is it becomes much more simpler, there's better graphics, and we have like free, uh, three D previews. I'm gonna use this machine that time, create a different code. Um, actually. This is the code, this is how that code looks. Not very exciting, but um, get this machine here again. Yeah. Okay, so here, here we have that machine, and, and you kind of already see that now we have everything 3D uh, visualization. This is that cut I just did over here. There we go. Um, and then we can simulate that. I want to do that real quick too. Fine. So this is our code. Don't need it that big. And if you look at that window down here, try to make that a little bit bigger. So basically, this is how the machine's gonna cut that. So we can simulate that. This is that mill head you saw before. Um, so we basically see before we cut, we see how that all works, how long that part is gonna take. Um, here I can start. It's like, wait a minute. If we cut from the bottom up, we're gonna have a splinter here. So we can. You know, before we even touch a piece of wood, we can figure out how that's going to work, if it is going to work, if we have splinter issues and things like that. So that's kind of where it's going. I'm really hoping we get to a point where we can use, you know, those are not the best graphics, it's very technical, but that's kind of my hope of that whole event. How can we use better technologies, like video game-like technologies to do simulations and just make the whole thing more appealing and more more easier to use for, for people so it can become a bit more mainstream. So again, it's kind of um, the more complex the product is, the more it makes sense to use those tools. So yeah, that's kind of what we do on the on the wood end. Um, I guess uh, maybe pull that up. I showed that earlier today. That's a Norman Foster building produced like that. Um, Again, here each part was, was custom, kind of like uh, your facade to each, each profile was, was a little different. So, um, you know, if you would have to do that by hand, it would be really difficult. Did you work on that? Before? Yeah, years ago. That's built in St. Moritz in Switzerland. And that was at the time I was working for the software company. And that's when you develop software, that's when, the, when it comes out, that's the real test, everything that is complex. And so I had a few hot lines on that, and we ended up like prepping files for the machine. Um, but it was uh, worked out really well. And the other thing too is like a lot of steel connectors here are modeled in there, and they go fully digital to a laser cutter. So now if for whatever reason there's a bolt axis or whatever in the wrong position, it will be the <coughs> same wrong in the steel as it is in the wood, and essentially not so bad. Or like checking um, tolerances as well, like um, you know how big do, does that, or how much bigger does that hole need to be versus the bolt. So that stuff, we can control all of that in here, and then from here we go to those different machines. So yeah, that's kind of uh, what we do. I, I work with Greg Damon. Uh, we have a shop, all of that is happening. Not all of that, that wasn't, but the, the stuff we're cutting is all happening in Portland, Oregon, and um, we're kind of trying to do projects basically on, on the West Coast for right now, but uh, we just, you know, whatever comes up that makes sense, we'll, we'll do it. I don't know, does anybody have any questions or anything else you'd like to see? Yeah. So uh, I'm assuming that your starting point typically is you've got a set of drawings from the architect and you're figuring out how to build the thing. Yeah. Right? So what's interesting is um, do you have any thoughts on how that process of not only making the end product higher quality and more efficient, but also maybe capturing other design opportunities if you were involved further up the chain in the design process. So have you 
and you're yeah. work more directly with an architect to absolutely yeah and stuff like that the more complex it gets the the more it makes sense for us to be involved it's part of what we do is machine coding and figuring all of that out but the biggest hurdle with that and i'm sure you have similar thoughts there is it's like the whole logistics how how big can that be be so we can still load in a truck and hang right. it and stuff so the geometry originally, like the concept design has a lot to do with A, how can we fab it? But most architects say we don't care, like you figured that out and we do. Uh, but also how can you how can you transport it? How do you get it up there? How does it interface with the stuff that is already there, the you know, the, the existing foundation? We we model or we produce everything accurately to that model. And that's all great as long as everything that is around, like the foundation or existing parts or buildings as long as that's super accurate. So we're, we're trying to be involved there doing things like laser scanning and taking existing geometry in here. But yes, the earlier we're involved, the better it is typically. And, and you know, we got all kind of data. We got the people, they send us spreadsheets with like essentially lists and they say, okay, and then this thing is that long and I want that angle and that bevel. We can create a machine file from that. Um, others send us PDF or SketchUps and, and some send us like, 3D solid models with everything already in there. They say, this is the tolerance we want, and we want you to fab it like that. And that's great. If if everybody would do a really accurate 3D model, and, and they're confident that we could fab based on that, then that would, our job would be a lot easier, right? Then we could focus on the, on the fab. Um, but again, somebody yesterday mentioned we need like an HTML format for, for the AEC industry. It's each of those machines, and that's now really silly, even within the same manufacturer, they use two or three different interface descriptions. So it's not all XML. It's like a, one machine uses that software with this thing. And so essentially, when we start a programming process, I have to know in which machine it goes. I can't just say, oh, no, that, that one is down. Let's just cut it on the other one. I have to recode, redo things. And, and that's an issue. And then from the architect to us too, like I mentioned ACES, SATs, I mentioned IFCs, uh, there's other 3D formats, step and, and others that we can use for that data exchange, but it is a problem. We do lose a lot of data. It's very time consuming. It's, it's sometimes not reliable. So that's kind of my hope too, is like how can we standardize like a 3D format that works ideally with application information in it already. Yeah. Um, can uh, the tablet can, it, would it be an effective replacement for you know, the other things? If, if, if architects were actually designing within that software first, or is that a positive or is it potentially be a negative? Um, yes and no. I mean, you know, we try to not go which tool is better than the other one. Those are all just tools. Can Cadre produce a set of architectural drawings? Yes, absolutely. Is it the best tool to do that? Maybe, you know, maybe not. It's, it's certainly more expensive than, than the Revit would be or, or some even cheaper tools. So, so it's kind of what makes sense. I think the bigger thing is, is design discipline, you know, how accurate do architects work? And that's, I mean, I'm not trying to step on somebody's feet, but that's a huge issue. Like most architects, they don't care much about the accuracy. For us, it's all about the accuracy. That's if, if we're not accurate, and, and like I'm talking about a hundreds or a thousand split of a millimeter, because it's errors kind of keep getting bigger, and so we have to be super accurate. And that's one of the main reasons why we redo models and we can't just import. And, and then the forward and backward, too. And, uh, but if, if you look, I always kind of compared to Europe too, and most European companies are vertically integrated, so they have their in-house engineering, architectural, uh, all of that stuff, and, and that makes things easier too. It's now, it's not the finger pointing now, it's your colleague asking you, it's like, hey, can you move that, or how we wanna do that? And, and I'm really hoping we, we get to a point too where fabricators work more directly with, with architects and, and engineers and, and trying to come up with cool solutions. And, and not just like, okay, my thing is done, now you figure it out, and so on. Yeah. Um, question for you, especially on these complex shapes, have you been involved in the actual construction side? Yeah. Okay, so what kind of, uh, are any issues coming up with the folks in the building departments that do plan check and the building inspectors? 
in terms of this is going to be stretching their boundaries, especially in the complex shapes uh, on how they do their plan check and do their inspection because the shapes are so different, how you're building it is so different. Uh, uh, have you run into any problems with those folks? Yes. Um, it depends where you build. The certain cities, um, I live in Vancouver Park and Canada, and that's a really difficult city to build in terms of that, and I'm sure, and I know from fact, San Francisco is too. Um, my whole point is, we do, a, like like Josh said too, we spend a huge amount of time and money for like stupid 2D sharp drawings that only, you know, they're not complete. There is so much missing. I mean, in here there's so much more information than, than in sharp drawings, and somebody goes through that, and at some point is like, yeah, I guess it looks good, and boom. And, and they want that, and we give them that. Um, so far, we weren't able to have models approved and sealed they say that's fine. And part of that is like, how do you exchange it and who is able to read a model like that? Um, but it's also true a lot of those sharp, most of those sharp drawings are not, in the end, this is not what we fabricate because it's, it gets approved at some point and it gets changed. And, and that, that's a, an issue also when you talk for BIM for facilities, like that's one of their biggest hurdles was like those, those buildings are not built like it is in the plan. And that's why we can't use those models because the end product is different than what's in the model. And um, so I, I think that's a huge issue, yes. And, and I think it's, it's, it's sad in a way that those building departments are that far behind. So, um, and then there's all the other issues too with um, on site. We, like I say, we have that high level of accuracy, but we're also working with an organic material that shrinks and stretches. Once you're doing like laminated uh, complex shapes, there's there's spring back. So even if that element is perfect, when we ship it out from us, eventually, you know, if it's not used right away, it kind of wants to go back to its original shape. And, and we, we factor that in. We, um, we laminate them more tight than they need to be, assuming they go back a certain level. But if they stay in the sun and the rain for months before they get used, then that's an issue too. So, so it's, it's not all that easy. There is issues with, with sites, and, and I think that's a, that's a huge, um, you know, you need a really good contractor that knows how to deal with those kind of things. Yeah. All right, I guess um, our time or my time is up, but I'll be around if you want to see or know more about it. I'd be happy to answer some questions, and if you ever happen to be up north, like we, I'd be happy to show you our machines. And, I'll give you a real intro.